Romans 4, verses 20 through 22. This is our penultimate text in our series on Romans 4, on righteousness by faith alone. Romans 4, 20 through 22. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. Beloved, the subject of Romans 4, verses 18 through 22, is the faith by which Father Abraham was justified. Last week, we looked at the first two verses there, 18 and 19. And this week, we're going to cover 20 through 22, which bring out different elements of this crucial truth about justifying faith. The faith by which we are declared righteous in the sight of God. Let's look this morning at Abraham's unwavering faith first what it was second what it gave and third what it received Abraham's unwavering faith what it was what it gave and what it received in short beloved Abraham had a mighty mighty faith Let us remind ourselves of the four key things that Abraham believed, like four steps, each ascending higher. He believed, number one, that he, aged 100, and his wife, aged 90, would have a son together. He believed that through this son, a whole nation would arise. Do you know any individual outside the Bible out of whom a nation arose? He believed third that out of this nation would come the promised seed, the Messiah, the Christ, the seed of the woman, the Savior. And fourth, that through him, the elect believing people of God Jews and Gentiles out of all the families of the earth would be saved. And he believed these things. I've outlined them as four things. They're really one thing. But he believed these things even though the first step upon which all the others depended was utterly without any precedent in the history of the world up until that point. The miraculous conception of a son. This was before Jacob and Esau in Genesis 25. This was before the birth of Samson in Judges 13. This is before the birth of Samuel in 1 Samuel 1. Before the miraculous birth of John the Baptist in Luke 1. And before the miraculous conception of the Son of God himself. Fully God and fully man. And remember too, all the carnal opposition of nature and reason that Abraham had to overcome in order to believe this promise. Abraham, you've had decades of marriage, decades of trial. You still don't have a son. You've had over two decades of marriage as a believer without any children. Sure, Abraham, even if your wife were to conceive tonight, you'd be a hundred. And she, she would be ninety, well past menopause. And doubtless the devil came in too to prod Abraham's flesh with thoughts like these. Abraham, it's all too good to be true. Don't believe nonsense like this. Abraham, this is just the wishful thinking 
of an old childless man. Abraham, catch yourself on. This is plain absurd. Abraham, this is the sort of delirious God talk that religious people fall into when they get carried away. Abraham, you've been sitting out of the midday sun for too long. You've got sunstroke. And yet, Abraham's response was not unbelief. Verse 20 says, He wasn't even weak in faith. He didn't even (coughs) stagger at the promise. His response was, according to Romans 4, that he believed in hope. The great good that God had set for him in the future, he believed. He was even strong in faith. In fact, verse 21 adds, that Abraham was fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. And we take our hats off to Father Abraham and we say here, Father Abraham, we wish that we had faith that you had. This same passage is one of the classic passages in Scripture that teaches that there are degrees of faith Some people are, or at least are at certain times in their Christian lives, quote, weak in faith, verse 19. And other people are, or at least are at times in their Christian life, strong in faith, verse 20. And that allows for all sorts of shades and degrees of strength and weaknesses in faith. We're told in our text that Abraham was not weak in faith, but that he was strong in faith, yea, that he was fully persuaded, utterly convinced, absolutely certain, God is going to do this. And all his neighbors thought he was raving mad. And perhaps the highest accolade here given The father Abraham's faith is that he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. And that English phrase, he staggered not, is a very attractive one. It means more literally, he didn't vacillate. He didn't go back and forth. Is this true or is this not true? He didn't vacillate. And so the same word is twice translated in James 1 verse 6, waver. You know the verse. But let him ask in faith, James says, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. You don't waver. God doesn't even answer prayers with wavering faith. And Abraham didn't stagger at the promise of God. He didn't waver. He knew that this was true. You can see the sort of wavering in which Abraham was not caught up. It didn't go like this with Abraham. Isn't this wonderful? God is going to give me, for my hundredth birthday as it were, a son. What a present. Ah, says unbelief. But Abraham, you're too old. And then on his other side, Abraham could have responded something like, but God is omnipotent. Ah, says doubt. But sure, your wife is past menopause, Abraham. Wavering, going back from one to the other. And a double-minded man, a wavering man, somebody that can't make up their mind, even in earthly things, unstable in all their ways. And the last thing you need is a faith that wavers. One minute you believe and the next minute you don't. That's not justifying faith. 
Scripture tells us how come Abraham, by the grace of God, how come Abraham did not waver? Verse 20 says, He staggered not or wavered not at the promise of God through unbelief. Unbelief is what makes people waver. And if you ask, how did Abraham avoid unbelief with regard to a promise which was, quite frankly, of itself staggering, the answer is that Abraham refused to think about those things that militated against God's promise. Verse 19 says, He considered not two things. What were the two things that Abraham did not consider did not reckon, could make void the promise of God. Number one, his own body. He did not consider his own body now dead when he was about 100 years old. He said, that is irrelevant. And the other thing that he didn't consider was his wife's body. Neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Abraham was strong in faith, fully persuaded, Because he didn't say to himself, well, I'm too old, or my wife's too old. These things are irrelevant. God has said. And that's a wonderful thing. And you can see from that, that this is written for our benefit. We, as believers in Jesus Christ, must not waver in our faith. And how do we stop wavering? Well, remember the story about Peter walking on the Sea of Galilee. When he's looking at Christ, he can walk on water. And whenever he feels on his cheek the wind growing boisterous and maybe see some white tops forming, little waves, takes his eye off Christ, Then he begins to sink. What are you looking at? Christ or the waves of the sea? He had two contradictory impulses and therefore he wavered. To give another New Testament example, think of the two on the Emmaus road. They were wavering as they were walking. On the one hand, They were thinking to themselves, Jesus of Nazareth was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people. Good. But then, bad, they were thinking, but he's just been crucified. And then, you can see the vacillation in their minds here. Then they said, but we'd heard a report from some of the women that they had seen angels and the grave was empty. Wavering. And Jesus met them because they were true believers and put them straight again and he used a rebuke. O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. You should have been reading your Bibles more closely. You should have understood that the same scriptures which said that a glorious Christ is going to come also said that he had to suffer before he entered into glory. You're wavering because your faith isn't strong and your faith isn't strong because you haven't been feeding on the word properly. Oh fools, and slow of heart to believe. And Abraham in our text is very different from the wavering of Peter who looked at the waves and the wind or the two in the Emmaus road who couldn't fit in the crucifixion of the Savior. Abraham in our text, he didn't waver because he considered not his own body, now dead, he's about a hundred, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. <coughs> the promise of God has entered in here. 
And our age is completely irrelevant. And this is crucial for the peace of heart for all of God's children. Let me give you some examples. Think of that great article of our faith, the resurrection of the dead on the last day. God has promised it. And then the devil makes you think about worms. 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 My body's going to be de- all gobbled up by little worms. How's God going to raise my body when it's all reduced to dust? And what do you do regarding the resurrection of the dead? You're wavering. On the one hand, God says, and the other hand, you've got these worms. As if the word of God isn't a lot more powerful than worms. I mean, you and I are more powerful than worms. And then you waver. Am I going to be raised from the dead or not? I don't know. God says this, but I've got a worm on the other side. And a lot of unnecessary, completely unnecessary (coughs) mental anguish and wasting your own time. You believe it like a little child. God says he's going to raise my body and all the bodies of believers from the dead on the last day. That settles it. And besides all that, Philippians 3 verse 21 teaches that the God who is able to subdue all things unto himself by his almighty power can raise my body from the dust no matter of all the worms in the whole world had been gobbling at my dead body. Believe it. And don't torture yourself. And to take another article of the faith, justification, the subject of Romans 4 and our text, the promise of God that he forgives all the sins of his people and that he reckons us fully clothed with his very righteousness earned for us by Jesus Christ in his lifelong obedience and sufferings on the cross, God has said this. And you do not say to yourself, because then you're into wavering, oh, but I have too many sins. Listen to what you're saying. Too many sins. Oh, but my sins are too big. My sins are too shameful. They're too disgusting. They're too wicked. And then you say to yourself, I've got to stop this wavering nonsense. Do you really think that Jesus Christ, the incarnate Son of God, can't deal with your sins? Hasn't already dealt with them. Do you really believe that when the wrath of God was poured out on Christ upon the cross, that that wasn't enough for all your sins? And do you really fail to understand that he dealt with shame on the cross and he sees all your sins already? He has already atoned for them. Believe. Don't waver. You're only bringing yourself mental anguish and grief. I want to add two other things at this point so that possible misconceptions are guarded against. The first is that this faith by which we believe is the gift of God. It's not something that a man whips up of himself. It doesn't and cannot arise from the flesh. And the faith is a gift of God is direct scriptural teaching in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, and Philippians 1, verse 29. Unto you it is given on the behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, says the last text. It's been given to you, two precious gifts, one to suffer for Christ, and two to believe in him. And when the Christian says that, he almost says, you know, I didn't even need a scripture for it. Didn't need a scripture to tell me that faith is a gift of God. Because everything is a gift of God in a world that's decreed and created and governed by God alone. Everything has to be a gift of God, especially those things that pertain to salvation. Sure didn't John the Baptist say, a man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. And didn't Paul teach us What hast thou that thou didst not receive? Think about it. Is there anything that you have 
that you didn't receive from God. Surely faith's in there too. And then I wanted especially to get to this pit, that even the measure of our faith, for every one of us, even the measure, the exact amount, I'm struggling for words here, but the exact amount that's given to every child of God, that's decreed by God too. He not only determines who will believe, but how strong or weak or otherwise their faith is. How much faith they have and how strong the faith of each one of us is at this or that time on our pilgrimage. It all comes from God. And then the second thing I want to add here is that we are called upon to pray. To pray for all sorts of things, but now especially for faith. And particularly to pray for faith when we are tempted to waver. The father of the deaf and mute boy, whom a demon tormented, so he threw himself into the fire or tried to drown himself. That father said, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. That's a good prayer. And the disciples too, after Jesus talked about great faith, achieving all sorts of things, said, Lord, increase our faith. We have faith. We would like our faith to be greater. And therefore they asked him. They prayed for an increase in faith. Abraham's faith. And we've seen what his unwavering faith was. And we come now to what his unwavering faith gave. Verse 20 says, He staggered or wavered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And here, give means ascribed. Abraham, by his faith, didn't give glory to God so that God became more glorious. Abraham, by faith, ascribed glory to God. He ascribed to God the glory that was his naturally and essentially. And Abraham's faith gave glory to God as the faithful God who keeps his promises. Believing that ascribes glory to God. That's what verse 20 says. He was strong in faith, giving glory to God. When Abraham said, God has promised that he's going to give to Sarah and me a son. You know he's going to do that. He's faithful and true. That glorified God. When Abraham said, God is going to make me into a great nation. believe that when Abraham understood and believed that out of that nation the promised seed would come that honoured God and when Abraham believed that God would save through this coming saviour elect believing Jews and Gentiles there was a man who was honouring God in his heart he said he's trustworthy He's faithful. I can rely upon him. And second, Abraham's faith gave glory to God as the omnipotent Lord who performs exactly what he had promised. Abraham was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform. Honouring God's power. The glory of God who could easily give to a couple whose combined age was 190 a son. That he could make from these two dry old sticks a great nation. Out of which the Saviour would come in the power of God. With God then saving through this promised seed. Believers out of all the families of the earth. That's might. 
that God is power over conception and multiplication and salvation. That God is power over one nation and over all the nations of the world. That God is power over the future, the next couple of years of the birth of Abraham's son, and over the whole future that is distant. That it's all under the hand of God. Abraham believed that and honored not only the faithfulness, but the might of God in fulfilling his promises. Beloved, it is precisely the faith of all the true sons and daughters of Abraham on planet Earth that glorifies God right now. Because apart from that faith of believers on Earth, there isn't anybody glorifying him at all. And when faith, first of all, receives as truth everything that God reveals in his word, God is honored. When faith receives the word that God is trying, three persons in the one being of God, that honors the Lord. When faith says, putting away all unbelief of Arminianism, this God is sovereign. He has decreed whatsoever comes to pass in that heart, there's glory being given to God. When faith says, I don't care how many or how eloquent or how many books all the unbelievers in the scientific world hate God and deny his creation, I believe it. God made it. There's some honor being offered to the Almighty. When faith says this world is under the power of God right now. There isn't a single atom that moves outside the will of Almighty God. He's feared and honored. When faith looks at the scripture and says not. There's a book that was written by a whole lot of men who disagree among themselves. But instead here's a book that God breathed that is a revelation from heaven. God is honored. When faith says that out of the darkness of this world there is a redeemer, Jesus Christ, and that he's going to come one day from heaven and judge the world according to a perfect standard of righteousness. In your heart right now, glory is being given to God. And now especially our text is saying that faith glorifies God especially now justifying faith when it rests upon the promise. That's especially the faith that glorifies God. And particularly now the promise of justification. So that faith is not only a certain knowledge whereby I hold for truth all that God has revealed to us in his word, but faith is also an assured confidence which the Holy Ghost works in my heart by the gospel, that not only to others, but to me also, remission of sin, everlasting righteousness and salvation is freely given by God of grace for Christ's sake. This justifying faith there glorifies God as the one who quickens the dead, as the one who calls those things which be not as though they are. As the God who justifies, amazingly, the ungodly. And the faith that holds on to that, that justifies us, goes on to say, wow, that's a glorious God. So we don't want any wavering. We don't want any wavering in our own hearts. We don't want any wavering in the church. Because, and this is the force of this text, all doubt... And all unbelief dishonors God. That is, if it's true faith supremely that glorifies God, then it's doubt and unbelief that is dishonoring to God. That says, in effect, God has promised this, but you know what? He's kind of like that neighbor down the road who says he's going to do the whole world for you, and you know what? Then you thank him up and down, and then he won't even come to do it. 
God's a bit like that. He makes promises and you just don't know if you can trust them. Isn't that to dishonor God? And this passage therefore teaches us that everything that is outside of true faith is sin. That principally, the one thing that glorifies God is believing his word. And if there's one thing that dishonors God, is to doubt his word. And you say again, that was a good prayer. Lord, increase our faith. Because the last thing I need as a Christian is to be going around holding in my heart this unbelief and this wavering nonsense that's bringing dishonor to God. And the last thing we need as a church is to be encouraging all sorts of doubt and unbelief in the word of God and coming to church instead of offering praise to God. We're dishonoring him. And the last thing we need in the worship service is people hither there scattered around the church sitting in pews thinking, you know, I don't even believe what the minister's saying is true. That's too much. He can get an old carry away up at the front, but I don't, I have my doubts about that. You'll be dishonoring God in church in the middle of a worship service on the Lord's Day. And this too is how justifying faith, the faith that looks to Christ and receives salvation, this is how justifying faith glorifies God because it condemns ourselves. Justifying faith accepts all of the judgments of God in the scripture against ourselves as true. You know what? God is exactly right. I am a wicked sinner. Of myself, I'm totally wretched. I agree with the judgment of God issued not merely against the whole human race, but against me. In Romans 1, 2 and 3, for example, that I am guilty and worthy of destruction. And so through faith, and I want you to listen closely because you need to understand this rightly, through faith, we justify God. What is it to justify? To declare righteous. Through faith, we say, God is righteous, and of myself, I am a sinner. And his judgment of me, of myself, is exactly right. I'm guilty. And I'm wretched. That justifies God. We believe that God is right. And that we are wrong. And it is precisely those people. By the wonder of the new birth. Who are brought to believe. That God is right. And we are wrong. That he is holy and we are wicked. Those who justify God. Are precisely the ones whom God justifies. God says, now that you've realized that I'm right and you're wrong, I declare you to be in the right. I declare you to be righteous. Because that same faith has laid hold on Jesus Christ. And his righteousness is made over to your account. And this is the problem with the world. The world goes around justifying itself. The ungodly man says, you know, I'm basically good. That is, he justifies himself. And he condemns God. God isn't right. I don't need a savior. I'm good of myself. The ungodly man justifies himself and condemns God. Whereas the true elect person justifies God, condemns himself, and God justifies him. Justifying faith looks holy to the Son of God, crucified and risen, and says, there's my only hope. There's the putting away of sins. There's the turning away of God's wrath. There's righteousness. And that's the message of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. No flesh should glory in God's presence. But in Jesus Christ he has made unto us righteousness. So that according as it is written. He that glorieth let him glory in the Lord. And this is the truth of a justifying faith that it supremely glorifies God. And now think of the solas of the Reformation. We're justified solely or only by faith alone, through grace alone, in Christ alone, according to Scripture alone, to the glory of God alone. And what does the text say? Abraham was strong in faith, justifying faith, 
giving glory to God. The Reformation was right. The Reformation is right. And the only way in which a human being can ever give glory to God is through justifying faith, looking outside of himself to Jesus alone. Apart from that, God gets his glory from the wicked in a different way. There isn't a single person in the world who from his own heart, by God's grace, gives a single iota of glory to God. That's total depravity. And lastly, and more briefly, we've seen what Abraham's unwavering faith was. We've seen what it gave, namely glory to God. And now we, going to the opposite of gave, see what it receives. What did Abraham's unwavering faith receive? Righteousness. Imputed righteousness. The righteousness of Jesus Christ, alien righteousness, earned 2,000 years before us and almost 2,000 years after Abraham. That righteousness outside of Abraham was reckoned to his account. Verse 22. And therefore, regarding all of this justifying faith in the previous verses, and therefore it, this justifying faith, was imputed to him for or unto righteousness. We're not content merely to say, well, isn't Abraham a great fellow? Fascinating, isn't it? Nor was Paul content to say that, because in the next verse he says, Now it was not reckon, written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also. What do we learn about justification and justified faith? We learn this. First of all, that justification, a righteous standing before God, is received by a true faith, not false faith. To go further, a little faith justifies. A little faith. As long as it's true faith, a little faith justifies. <coughs> and a little faith justifies, that is, receives the full righteousness of God just as much as a great faith. A little faith won't sanctify you as much as a great faith. With a little faith, you won't derive as much comfort from your justification as you ought. But a little faith, most certainly, will justify you. Because the issue there isn't how much for the fact of justification, it's is it a true faith? But a wavering faith does not justify in one's conscience. That is, let's say you're in church today and you're a true believer. You are justified. But if, through backsliding or worldliness, you're not doing too well spiritually and you're struggling to believe this, you won't receive the comfort of it in your conscience. To restate this, the very first time a child of God believes, he's justified. And he knows he's justified. And that faith with which he was justified that first time was for sure, for everybody who's justified, an unwavering faith. Not a doubting faith. This is it. I know it's true. And all subsequent times when the believer believes unwaveringly, he receives this justification. He knows all my sins are forgiven and righteousness is made over to me. But if the believer gives way to the flesh, backslides and wavers in his faith, he is still objectively justified. God doesn't unimpute that righteousness to him. No truly justified person can perish. He can never be condemned. But the believer who's backsliding and stuck in wavering loses the blessedness of his justification, the comfort of his imputed righteousness, the peace of that he ought to have in his consciousness. We read about Abraham in Genesis 15. His faith is unwavering. 
He saw the stars in heaven. He believed. It was unwavering faith. It was counted unto him for righteousness. And he knew it. And then in the next chapter. His wife's beginning to waver. And she gets him to waver. And then he goes into Hagar. And he wasn't feeling just as confident. And the blessedness and peace of his justification wasn't as dear and meaningful to him then. Because now I don't know if God, I maybe have to give God a hand. Take this other second wife and have a child by the concubine. Maybe God will reckon that to be the promised seed. That's not fair. He's wavering. And it didn't do him any good in his consciousness. And so the true justifying faith of the believer looks outside of himself and looks to and relies on the promise of God. That's what justifying faith looks at. The promise of God. The promise of God in Jesus Christ. The promise of God in Christ for the forgiveness of all sins and unspotted righteousness. And justifying faith knows that this is certain because of the truth and power of the promising God. He can do and he will do what is impossible for all creatures and what is completely against man's carnal nature. And so the calling of this text in one word is believe. Believe like a little child. Believe now and believe always and believe unwaveringly. Putting away all the foolish doubts. Refusing to look at those things that are contrary to the word of God. Although you know they're there but you discount them. And so know that the righteousness of God in Christ is reckoned to you. And in being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Amen. Our Father in heaven, bless to us thy word, that our carnal doubts and fears may be put aside, and that we may know that we do not have to work for acceptance with thee, but that we are already accepted in the beloved. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.